Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second session on nasopharyngeal cancer. We welcome Dr. Cecil Kanikal, additional professor, clinical oncologist, and expert in head and neck radiation oncology. Yesterday, indeed, uh, sir gave very excellent presentation on an technical staging of this complex site. Today, sir has joined us to cover the aspects of contouring in nasopharyngeal cancer and to discuss evidence-based management. So, I request all the participants to stay focused and attentive as well as participate actively through the chat box for your queries. Uh, welcome, sir. I request you to proceed for the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sir. You can audible. Okay, thank you. So, I'm Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, slides, you, can you see the slides? Yes, sir. The slides are visible. Thank you very much. So, we will, we will today discuss, one, the management. Second, the contouring part. So, two, yesterday we have discussed about the radiological anatomy, staging, and investigations for carcinoma nasopharynx. Today, we will be discussing about the evolution of chemo radiation. So we all know that for any malignancy, the treatment options are one, radiotherapy, second, surgery, third is chemotherapy. And when we discuss about carcinoma nasopharynx, it is mainly an interplay between radiotherapy and radiotherapy and chemotherapy. The role of surgery is very limited. The role of surgery is limited to two things. One, for biopsy, endoscopy and a biopsy, the primary tumor. Number two, number two, number two for a neck dissection, if there is a residual node after chemo radiation. These are the two indications for surgery in carcinoma nasopharynx. Radiotherapy forms the backbone of the treatment of carcinoma nasopharynx. Why radiotherapy? Because there is an excellent response to radiation and chemotherapy. Because of the response, Second is the proximity to very critical structures, anatomical location, ex surgical ex ex exposure and clearance is an issue. Functional uh, outcomes are very poor after surgery and retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which cannot be surgically treated. That is why we prefer radiation after uh, over surgery. And what is the evidence for the same? We know that the radiotherapy can be given either by 2D, three-dimensional radiotherapy, intensity model iteration, uh, then the uh, the future directions. So we know that majority of the patients now are treated by, by the olimetric treatment, uh, intensity modulate radiation under image guidance. So we will discuss about the how the evolution from 2D to IMRT has developed, has helped in the increasing the survival and also reducing the recurrence. So when we discuss the, we know that in carcinoma nasopharynx, this is a unique tumor. Even in T1 N0, we need to treat the whole of the nasopharynx and the whole of the neck. There is some controversy regarding in a T1 N0 whether we need to treat the lower neck. By and large, by, by principle, the principle is that we need to treat the primary and the whole neck to, uh, whole neck should be treated. The primary should receive, the tumor should receive 70 degree equivalent dose. And the involved nodes also should receive 70 degree equivalent nodes. And those patients who have a, areas where there is high chance for relapse, they are called the high risk uh, areas where there is a high risk of involvement. At least this area should receive 60 degree. And the prophylactic dose that comes mainly in the nodal area should receive 50 to 54 degree. The most important factor which determines the functional most determining factor which determines the outcome is the total dose. If you give increase the dose per fraction, there is a high chance for long-term toxicity. So if you treat a patient with carcinoma nasopharynx T1 or a T2, the five-year local regional control with two-dimensional radiotherapy is around 90 to 
And if you treat with two-dimensional lithotripsy for a T3 or T4 disease, the five-year leucorrhageal control is around 40 to 70 percent. What does it mean? If you give IMRT, then we may be able to reduce the morbidity in Ireland disease. Number one. Number two, we may be able to increase the leucorrhageal control in T3 and T4 disease. Let us see how it has improved with IMRT. So T1 and T2 with 2D alone, it is 90 to 100 percent. T3 to T4, the five-year leucorrhageal control is around 40 to 70 percent. Coming to the, this is a landmark paper which published in Radiotherapy and Oncology uh, in 2014 by Anne W. Lee, that's a clinic in the Department of Clinical Oncology from Hong Kong. And uh, this paper analyzed the evolution of treatment for nasopharyngeal carcinoma, success and setback in the intensity model of radiotherapy era. This is a landmark paper, although it is a retrospective analysis. It has clearly defined how the progress, how it has progressed from 2D to IMRT. When we use a 2D to IMRT in terms of five-year local, local failure free survival, disease-free survival, and overall survival, there was an impact in all the parameters when it was from 2D to IMRT. So IMRT has improved local failure free survival, disease free survival, and overall survival compared to two-dimensional radiotherapy or three-dimensional radiotherapy. And if you look into the benefit, it was mainly seen in T3 and T4 disease. You can see that. So when you ba go back to the previous slide, you can see that in T3 and T4, the five-year local control was very poor with two-dimensional radiotherapy. This has dramatically improved with IMRT, and this is quite statistically significant. You can see that it was quite statistically significant. And that is applicable for stage three and stage four. You can see that with IMRT, there is a, there is a five-year improvement Year in the overall survival for T3 and T4 disease. Sorry, stage three and stage four disease. So the magnitude of benefit is mainly seen in T3 and T4 disease. Yes, can you hear me? Any problem? We can hear you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. And apart from the improvement in the local failure fish survival, and also there is an improvement in survival, there was a dramatic reduction in local, uh, dramatic reduction in toxicity. If you look into the all neurological toxicity, compared to two-dimensional day therapy basis IMRT, it was quite statistically significant. And this is applicable for temporal lobe necrosis, and all the neurological activities, uh, neurological toxicities together, and also the other parameters are also better with IMRT. So the conclusion from this paper was that there was a improvement in local failure free survival, there was a five-year improvement in disease free survival, and there was a five-year improvement in overall survival when patients were treated with IMRT compared to two-dimensional therapy. Again, the people can ask, is there any, it is a retrospective analysis. Is there any phase three data? Because we all are oncologists and we believe only in evidence. Okay, this is a phase three randomized trial published in Green Journal in 2012, comparing the intensity moderate radiotherapy basis conventional two dimensional radiotherapy for the treatment of carcinoma nasopharyngeal. And this included large number of patients were randomized either to IMRT arm or two dimensional radiotherapy. And when they analyzed the results, it was found that the local control rate regional control rate and overall survival were better in patients who received IMRT compared to two-dimensional radiotherapy. This is applicable for acute complications and also if you look into the skin and mucosal reaction there was no much difference but when we analyze the long-term complications like temporal lobe necrosis, neuropathy, all other parameters like cranial nerve palsies, then the Christmas neck fibrosis, the, the xerostomia, Hearing loss, all were better in patients who received IMRT compared to two-dimensional radiotherapy. So what does it mean? It means that there is a level one evidence to say that IMRT improves survival in patients with carcinoma and Now coming to the stage, now coming to the stage waste management, and T1 and 0, the standard treatment is to keep radiotherapy. Stage two is a gray area. The ongoing phase three clinical trials are evaluating the role of chemotherapy. Because in stage two, there are conflicting results are there. There are trials which have shown that chemo has an impact. There are trials have shown that the chemo has no impact if you treat the patient with IMRT. So there is a phase three trial which is underway evaluating the role of chemotherapy compared to IMRT alone in patients with stage two carcinoma nasopharynx. And when these results are available, the results of this clinical trial was available, then we will be able to say whether chemo can be omitted from stage two carcinoma 
In stage 3 and stage 4a, the standard treatment is to give chemo radiation. Whether it is concurrent, induction chemo followed by chemo radiation or chemo radiation followed by adjuvant. That we will discuss in the subsequent slides. And in stage 4b, if a patient with stage 4b, this patient also will not be treated with palliative intent. But I will not be discussing that today because that's not my topic of discussion. Okay, so I will concentrate mainly stage 2 and stage 3, stage 4a. Uh, what is the treatment? We look into the evolution of chemo radiation in carcinoma nasopharynx. The first landmark paper was published in JCO in 1998. This was an intergroup trial, intergroup trial 0099, which was conducted in the US. This was initiated by the GAC group, SOC group, and Southwest Oncology group, intergroup trial. And the, the clinical design was the patients were randomized either to give radiation therapy alone or concurrent chemo with 70 grain 35 plus three cycles of concurrent chemo followed by three cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. This was, this was a clinical trial comparing radiotherapy basis, concurrent chemo followed by three cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. And this was published in JCO in 1998, landmark paper, which showed that three-year progression free survival and three-year overall survival were better in patients who received concurrent chemo followed by adjuvant chemotherapy compared to patients who received radiotherapy alone. And this was quite statistically significant. And but this patient, this clinical trial had a lot of flaws. Why? One, they, we do not know whether the magnitude of benefit came from concurrent or adjuvant or both. Number one. Number two, this trial was prematurely closed because the interim analysis showed that there is huge survival benefit for patients who received chemo arm. So the independent data monitoring committee said that it is time to close the clinical trial and reveal the results. The RT alone um, performed worse than expected compared to the contemporary series. And all RT techniques were used. And many patients were type 1 nasopharyngeal carcinoma because we know that it is mainly the type 2 and type 2A and 2B. They are more common, but type 1, they were not EB related. The adjuvant, the FPF, and the main concern was that the adjuvant chemotherapy was possible. The three cycles of cisplatin and 5 fluoroiracil was possible only around 55% of the patients who are planned, who are assigned to the adjuvant. Now, when based on this two clinic, based on this clinical trial, there was an attempt from one from the Hong Kong group and other is from the Singapore, Singapore group. The, the Singapore group, it was the, the, uh, the Joseph P was the PI clinic and the similar design and the, uh, the, the, the Hong Kong trial, this was at the Hong Kong NPC 9901 clinical trial and this Ann W. Lee was the PI for the clinical trial. And the results both published in same issue uh, on back to back in uh, JCO in 2005. And that is in, it showed that there is difference, there is a conflicting results. The Joseph B's paper, that is a Singapore paper, which showed that there is benefit if you give adding chemotherapy in the fashion of concurrent followed by adjuvant. But the Hong Kong paper failed to show benefit. You can see that in Singapore, the three-year overall survival was there is a 15% improvement in patients who received chemo followed by concurrent chemo followed by adjuvant chemotherapy compared to radiotherapy alone. And this was benefit was seen in reduction in distant metastasis also. And it was reduced from 38% to 38% to 18%. And both the values were significant. Whereas in Hong Kong, there was no difference. The three-year overall survival was 78% in both arms. There was no reduction in distant metastasis also. And p-value was not significant. What does it mean? It means there is conflicting results. So how to solve it? Then we will, we will come up with a meta-analysis. There are at least many meta-analysis. The first meta-analysis was published in 2004 in JCO, which have showed that the benefit was confined only to patients who are receiving concurrent chemo. There was no benefit in patients who received adjuvant or induction chemotherapy. And there was a MAC-NC meta-analysis, MAC-NPC meta-analysis. It was published in GCO, sorry, in Red Journal in 2006. The hazard ratio was of death in patients who received chemotherapy was 0.82. The absolute benefit was 6%. Again, the benefit was confined to patients who received concurrent. That is, hazard ratio of death was 0.6. There's a 40% relative reduction in that who patients who received concurrent, uh, concurrent chemotherapy. And the benefit was not seen in patients who received adjuvant or induction chemotherapy. Okay, then, so that was the conclusion of this uh, the meta-analysis. And this was updated in 2015 in Lancet Oncology. 
It has shown that the magnitude of benefit was seen in patients who received concomitant and concomitant plus adjuvant. This was the this is a, the benefit. Now again, there was a meta-analysis published in uh, 2017 in JCO. What is the best treatment of locally advanced nasopharyngeal carcinoma? It was an individual patient data meta-analysis. It also similar uh, results compared to the Lancet Oncology publication in 2015. Now the biggest question is that. So what is the benefit of giving adjuvant chemotherapy in addition to concurrent chemoradiation or concurrent chemoradiation is enough? There is only one phase three trial really addressing this problem. So this was a clinical trial comparing concurrent chemo followed by adjuvant chemotherapy versus concurrent chemo alone. Because the two meta-analysis have shown that this adjuvant is not really working. The one, the, the Hong Kong group failed to show the benefit. So they have, uh, the Chinese people came with a phase three trial which published in Lancet Oncology in 2012. This was a this was a uh, this was a clinical trial. The locally advanced nasopharyngeal carcinoma patients were randomized either to the the experimental arm of the ulcera, that is the concurrent chemo followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, versus the concurrent chemo alone. So the main objective of this clinical trial was to know what is the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy in addition to the concurrent chemo radiation. Initially, the data was published in Lancet Oncology with a median follow-up of 37.8 months, and the same clinical trial was updated in European Journal of Cancer in 2017, which showed that there is no benefit because uh, either in the initial publication or in the updated publication with a long-term follow-up, it have shown that either in failure-free survival, overall survival, local regional failure-free survival, or distant failure-free survival, there was no benefit compared to patients compared to patients who received the adjuvant chemotherapy. So what does it mean? There is no point in giving adjuvant chemotherapy. So in 2012, we have stopped giving adjuvant chemotherapy for carcinoma and pharynx when the initial publication came in Lancet Oncology. So the, the, from, from this paper, the standard treatment for locally advanced carcinoma and pharynx is concurrent chemoradiation alone. Now the question is that, is there any benefit by giving induction chemotherapy? So I am summarizing what I have told you so far. Now, initially it was two-dimensional radiotherapy. Now we have seen the NWV's paper in 2014. Then there was a phase three randomized trial published in Green Journal in 2012. Both showed that from two-dimensional radiotherapy to IMRT, there was an improvement in overall survival. There was an improvement in local regional control. There was a reduction. There was so this was the IMRT has showed benefit. Now. The, when we use IMRT in stage 2 disease, like that is T1N1, T2N0, or T2N1, whether we need to give chemotherapy, there is a phase 3 clinical trial is underway. Now, regarding chemotherapy, then the radical radiotherapy alone was the treatment. From the ulcera, it have shown that concurrent followed by adjuvant was the standard of care. Then, from the, the Singapore paper and the NW Lee's paper, that is the Hong Kong paper, they showed conflicting results. Now to know this, what is the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy compared to concurrent chemo radiation alone? Initially, I've shown that the Chen et al. paper published in Lancet Oncology in 2012, updated in European Journal of Cancer in 2017, have shown that concurrent chemo radiation is the standard. Now, from there, two approaches were taken. One, do we need to give adjuvant chemotherapy in high risk patients, that is, who have high risk EBV? The two clinical trials were there. I will discuss that. Now, second approach is that why don't you incorporate neoadjuvant chemotherapy before the standard concurrent chemo radiation? Because the most common site of relapse in carcinoma and isopharynx is systemic failure. So why don't we incorporate this neoadjuvant chemotherapy before the standard concurrent chemo radiation? There are six phase three randomized trials published in 2018-2019. I've shown that there is benefit if you incorporate induction chemotherapy compared to concurrent chemo radiation. So the design of all the clinical trial was that, was what is there any benefit by giving induction chemotherapy, that is neoadjuvant chemotherapy due to three cycles prior to the concurrent chemo radiation versus the concurrent chemo radiation alone. So that was the backbone of the design of the clinical trials. So this is a, the first clinical trial, which was initially published in 2017 in your Journal of Cancer, updated last year into the same journal in 2019. 
So these patients with stage 3 locally advanced carcinoma nasopharynx patients excluded T3, N0 or N1 patients were excluded. IMRT was not mandatory. Patients were given two cycles of this platinum and 5 fluorocarbonyl before the concurrent chemo radiation. The primary endpoint of this trial was disease free survival and distant metastasis free survival. And this was an update in 2019, initial publication in 2017, which showed that in the update, which have shown that disease free survival was benefit. There's a disease free survival benefit, but there was no reduction in distant metastasis. There, sorry, there's reduction in distant metastasis. There is an improvement in overall survival, but there was no difference between the local regional failure free survival. So the conclusion is that there was an improvement in survival and there is a reduction in distant metastasis. So that may be the reason why there is an improvement in survival, but the local regional control remained the same. So the concurrent chemo radiation with IMRT, there is an improvement in local regional control. And if you give induction chemotherapy, there is a reduction in metastasis. So that, that will translate into an improvement in overall survival. So this is the paper. The second paper, this is paper published initially in Lancet Oncology in 2016. This was patients with stage 3 and stage 4 patients were randomized either to give concurrent chemo radiation or three cycles of TPF. It was a modified TPF. It is not 750, 75 or 75. There's a modified TPF because in phase 2 trials have shown that if you give the full dose of TPF, that subsequently the patients were not tolerating the concurrent chemo radiation. So that's why they have modified. This is called the light TPF in nasopharynx. That is 60, 60, and 600 milligram per meter square. This platinum was 60 milligram per meter square given on day one. Docetaxel given 60 milligram per meter square at day one. And 5 fluorouracil 600 milligram per meter square given day one to day five. We uh, usually, usually use this protocol. The light, it is called the light TPF protocol. And uh, the, in T3 and T4 patients were excluded. IMRT was mandatory. The primary endpoint of this clinical trial was failure free survival and initially published in Lancet Oncology in 2016, updated in the International Journal of Cancer in 2019 last year, which showed that those patients who received induction chemo prior to the concurrent chemo radiation, there was an increase in toxicity. The grade 3 and grade 4 toxicity were higher. In this, If you look into the grade 3 toxicity, there's 55% in patients who received concurrent chemo radiation. And if you give induction, uh, this this is fair, this was uh, uh, 53. Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, then the neutropenia all were more in patients who received induction chemotherapy prior to the concurrent chemo radiation. The toxicity was higher, but there is an increase in the cells. Distant failure free survival. This is significant. There was no reduction in local regional failure free survival similar to the previous trial, but there was a improvement failure free survival was the primary endpoint the overall survival was also showing survival benefit in those patients who received three cycles of light tpf now there is the third attempt what was, that was by the taiwan cooperative oncology group that is a 1303 clinical trial this included 4a and 4b okay. that's that is based on the previous staging now we know that there's 4b is carcinoma nasopharynx is 4b is a distant metastasis so what they have used is a very uh, consisted of a very complex chemo regime. They used three cycles of uh, mel mitomycin, epirubicin, cisplatin, pyfluorouracil, and leucovarin, and followed by chemo radiation or chemo radiation alone. They have shown that this uh, the toxicity were more in patients who received induction chemotherapy prior to the chemo radiation. The benefit was seen in patients. Overall benefit was is this patient who received. Uh, the disease-free survival, the treatment group one. This was this was showing a benefit, and the, in the overall survival, it was it was shown that the patients who had N3B disease or patients who have this is showing a benefit. But in overall survival, there was no much difference when all patients were together. When they did a subset analysis, it was found that patients who have N3 nodes benefit from the com this uh, uh, induction chemotherapy. The five-year disease-free survival, uh, uh, so there was uh, uh, five-year local regional failure-free survival benefit was there. There was no reduction in distant metastasis, no overall survival benefit, but there was a grade three and grade four toxin. Now, whether the data is confined to the uh, the Southeast Asia, no. This is an attempt from the French group. There's a GOTEC 2006 O2 clinical trial published in Annals of Oncology in 2018, two years back. And this patient, this was a, it was started as a phase three trial, 
and locally advanced nasopharyngeal carcinoma patients were randomized either to keep concurrent chemo radiation or three cycles of standard TPF followed by concurrent chemo radiation. And the number of patients were included were only 83. And this patient, this trial was prematurely closed due to poor patient accrual. And when they published the data, it was found that it, uh, the data which published, which showed that the overall survival, there was a trend towards improvement in overall, overall survival. The p-value is 0 0.059, and there is a trend towards improvement in overall survival. But there was a statistically significant progression in survival, a sub ratio of uh, it was 0 0.44. And uh, so this was the uh, the European attempt. And the there is another paper from the Singapore group, which which showed that this is a complex clinical trial. Uh, it showed similar design. It was showed, it showed, uh, it showed chemo, chemo with, it, they showed gemcitabine, gemcitabine, carboplatin, and paclitaxel induction chemotherapy. And what they have found that the, there was no difference in the outcomes. So there is conflicting results for induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation versus concurrent chemo radiation. The Taiwanese group showed the benefit in terms of disease free survival, but there was no overall survival benefit. Initial two Chinese papers, which have shown there is benefit. They prematurely closed. The European trial did not show any improvement in survival. The Singapore group showed there is no benefit in terms of disease-free survival. There is no reduction in distant metastasis. There was no reduction in distant metastasis, or there was no difference in overall survival. Now, this is a new addition to the list. This paper was presented in the 2019 ASCO annual meeting and published in New England Journal of Medicine 2019. This is testing the role of cisplatin plus gemcitabine as induction chemotherapy. And we know that cisplatin gemcitabine is superior to cisplatin plus 5-chlorouracil in veteran and metastatic carcinoma in esopharynx based on a landmark paper published in Lancet Oncology in 2016. And this showed that the toxicity profile and the efficacy is better in patients who receive cisplatin gemcitabine compared to cisplatin and 5-chlorouracil. So why don't we use the same regime in locally advanced carcinoma and The 480 patients were randomized either to receive three cycles of this is gem followed by chemo radiation or concurrent chemo radiation alone. The primary endpoint was relapsed free survival. And the data was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. And it showed that the toxicity were better in were toxicity were more in patients who received induction chemotherapy. And we have also tested in few patients, the toxicity is very high. If you give induction chemotherapy, this is gem. The toxicity really comes in the concurrent part. The 20, this is a 20%. This is, if you look, you can see that is a 75, 44. You can see that the adverse events were more. So you can see that grade three or grade four toxicity in the induction chemo was 75.7% basis, 55.7% in patients who received chemo radiation alone. There was a 20% increase in grade three and grade four toxicity. And this is up mainly with mainly the hematological toxic. When they analyzed the result, the primary endpoint was relapsed free survival. There is a benefit. The three year recurrence free survival was better in patients who received cisgem compared to chemo radiation, cisgem induction followed by chemo radiation compared to concurrent chemo radiation alone. And the local regional failure free survival, there was no difference. But the uh, overall survival, distant recurrence free survival were all better in patients who received this gem as induction chemotherapy prior to the concurrent chemo radiation. Yesterday, I told you that in patients who receive concurrent chemo radiation, the three-year overall survival is 90 more than 90 percent. So you can see that in those patients who receive concurrent chemo radiation, the three-year overall survival is 90.3 percent. And if you give cis gem induction chemotherapy, there is a three point. There is another three percent. So another uh, say another say four percent, four point three percent improvement in overall survival with an increase of 20% grade 3 and grade 4 toxicity. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you are bored with all this uh, jargons, but I will summarize the whole thing uh, in one slide. So if you look into the various clinical trials which we have discussed today, that's a six randomized clinical trials. You can see that three clinical trials have shown an improvement in survival. Three clinical trials have not shown any improvement in survival. How to solve? This again, you do a meta-analysis, and uh, so next uh, next question is that which is if you if you are convinced that we have seen clinical trials with cisplatin, 5 fluorouracil with two cycles, 
We have seen clinical trial with light TPF. We have seen induction chemotherapy with cisplatin and gemcitabine. So which induction chemotherapy? There is no clinical trial comparing cis gem versus a cisplatin based combination chemotherapy, 5-fluorouracil or dosiflax. There is a clinical trial which published in Translational Oncology in 2019 last year comparing comparing the cisplatin 5-fluorouracil versus the TPF. That is a three drug. There is a slight difference in the European or the light TPF. This is 75, 75 and 16 mg per meter square or the 100 mg per meter square and 18 mg per meter square of uh, day 1 to day 5 cisplatin 5-fluorouracil. The conclusion from this paper is that three-year progression is survival and three-year overall survival, there is no difference. And we need more long-term follow-up. But as of now, we can only say that this cisplatin-based induction chemotherapy has shown there is improvement in overall survival in 50% of the clinical trials. We need an individual patient data meta-analysis to clearly say that it really have an impact on overall survival. But there is, they have consistently shown there is reduction in distant metastasis. And also, there is reduction in any relapse. But local renal failure free survival, or there is no the reduction, there is no impact on local control. Local regional control. So that is the conclusion from the, uh, so in the there are two meta analysis. This is one published in, uh, in Lean Journal in 2018, other published in the clinical research, clinical cancer research in 2000 uh, is also published in 2018 two meta-analysis published in 2018 both have shown similar results have shown that there is benefit in terms of overall survival and also there is a reduction in uh, the reduction in distant metastasis but the author themselves say that this is not an individual patient data meta-analysis and the results should be interpreted with caution okay Coming to the uh, NCCN guidelines and the uh, the ESMO guidelines, you can see that the NCCN guidelines, the last head and neck NCCN guideline was updated online on June 9th of 2020. And it shows that even in zero, it is radical radiotherapy to nasopharynx and elective RP to neck. So that we have discussed for T1, all the locally advanced up to stage 4A, stand, they have given three options, actually four options. Either you give induction chemo followed by concurrent chemo radiation, or you give concurrent chemo followed by adjuvant because it was based on their paper in the group trial 0099, which we discussed in initially. The paper came in JCO 1998. And the other is the third option, which is the fourth option, which is given is concurrent chemo radiation alone, not followed by adjuvant chemo. But there was slight difference in the opinion among the panel members for that. So many opted for either induction chemo followed by concurrent chemo radiation or concurrent chemo radiation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. And comparing these two options, there is no prospective data. There was a retrospective data which published in British Medical Journal, US PAC, which have shown that similar effect. But the prospective trials are not there because all the clinical trials are now comparing. Nobody believes in adjuvant chemotherapy based on the landmark paper published in Lancet Oncology in 2012 updated in GCO in 2017. So many believe that the concurrent chemo radiation either to better to switch to induction rather than give adjuvant chemo. Now coming to the second part. Okay, so this is the guideline. Uh, so if you if you are interested, you can read my this is one of my review article published in Journal of Oncology in uh, you can Google you can search the PubMed. Uh, this is current role of chemotherapy in non metastatic carcinoma. If you are interested, you can go through this review article. I have discussed uh, all the points which we discussed. Now, the biggest question is that what is the role of chemotherapy in stage 2 carcinoma? If you give IMRT, can we avoid chemotherapy? Because then we can avoid the morbidity. So, this is a meta analysis which published in 2018, which have shown that there is no difference, there is no out benefit. If you give either in terms of distant metastasis free failure free survival, the progression free survival, or in terms of overall survival, there is no difference if you give chemotherapy for stage two patients. There was a phase two trial which was present in Astro Animal Meeting in 2018. To best of my knowledge, this was not this is not published. There is a phase three trial which is underway to evaluate the role of 
the chemotherapy concurrent chemo with IMRT basis IMRT alone in stage 2 patients. There was a Chinese paper which published in GNCI in 2011 have shown that there is benefit with chemotherapy concurrent chemotherapy compared to radiotherapy alone but this was not IMRT. That is the reason why in many of the guidelines including SMO in stage 2 they chemo plus bar minus RT plus bar minus chemo. So that is a gray zone. Once we have the phase 3 data, we will be able to say that whether the chemo can be avoided in patients with stage 2 who are undergoing IMR. Now the second approach is to give uh, the adjuvant chemotherapy based on risk adopted. Risk adopted. So those patients who receive concurrent chemo radiation and if those patients who have a high titer of EBV after 6 to 8 weeks of chemo radiation, then you give induction, uh, sorry, adjuvant chemotherapy. This platinum 5 fluorouracil to pre cycle. And if the patient who have no high risk, that is no high EBV value, uh, after DNA value, after chemo radiation, were observed. So the first attempt was from the nasopharyngeal, uh, uh, Hong Kong nasopharyngeal cancer study group. This was a phase 3 trial. And this was uh, presented in ASCO annual meeting in 2017 and uh, published in JCO. JCO uh, in the next year. Uh, in the next year. Uh, uh, this is a Hong Kong NPC study 0502 clinical trial. It was patients who have uh, advanced nasopharyngeal carcinoma, those who had no clinical or radiological evidence of distant metastasis diagnosis, and after six to eight weeks were randomized either to give three cycles of, say, either to give cisplatin, gemcitabine, into six cycles or no chemotherapy. So that was the uh, cli cli inclusion criteria. And when they analyzed the results, and published, which showed that there is no benefit. Published, which showed that, that there is no benefit. There is no benefit, which is published in JCO in 2018. Again, there is another clinical trial which is underway, that is the NRG, by those patients who have EBV DNA after the chemo radiation. Those patients initially EBV DNA high dose. Then after the uh, those patients who have EBV DNA negative after chemo radiation were randomized either to give observe there is no chemo or cisplatin 5 fluorouracil free cycle. Those patients who have DNA, EBV DNA positive after chemo radiation are randomized either to give cisplatin 5 fluorouracil free cycles or gemcitabine plus paclitaxel into three cycles. And this clinical trial is underway. So those patients who have nasopharyngeal carcinoma with distant metastasis at percentage, suppose a corpus, it is less than 5%, the patient who have say CN esopharynx, bulky nodes, patient who have lung nodules, patient who have bone meds, liver meds at presentation. Now how to approach this problem? So I will be discussing this clinical scenario. I will not be discussing today. I will, uh, those who are interested, catch me on chart rounds on uh, 20th of August. So I will discuss the customer. Our kind of candidates for palliative treatment. The main thrust on that presentation will be the oncologist's perspective, whether to go palliative chemotherapy, when to give palliative radiation, when to observe patient, when to consider a patient for best supportive care in patients who are not concerned for curative approach. So catch me on chart rounds on 20th August at 4 p.m. So I'll be discuss the carcinoma nasopharynx with stage 4B at presentation. Yes, now we are coming to uh, you want me to take any questions now or can I proceed with the contouring part? If you have any burning questions, I can solve it because if you are very clear with as of now what I have discussed yesterday until now, then the contouring is very easy. Please continue. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, this. Now the second part, when we discuss, this is the, uh, actually, we need to consider these two landmark papers. That is the international guideline for delineation of Clinical Tarsitolians for carcinoma and acepharynx, again, by the PR, again, the first author is Anne W. Lee. You come across a lot of papers from by her in, in acepharynx. And uh, other is the recommendation for contouring of uh, an acepharyngeal carcinoma, the contouring of the organ address, OIRs. I will not discuss this paper because I may not be able to finish because that itself is a big topic. So I will consider only about the contouring of the primary and the node and not the OIRs. You know that for target oleum delineation, the most this is the most important critical spanning IMRT 
it should be a perfect balance between the tumor and the OIR. The inaccurate delineation can lead on to geographic miss or increased toxicity. It can impact on local little control rates and it subsequently the overall survival. So when we discuss about tartatolin delineation for carcinoma and esophagus, like any other tumor, it is a tartatolin delineation of primary and tartatolin delineation of the dorsal regions. First, I will discuss. So the thumb rule is that those patients who have gross disease like primary tumor or node, then you should use a 70 gray equivalent dose. 70 gray, that's seven. You can use 70 gray in 35. So we I use the we use this protocol, 66 gray, that is the with the SIP simultaneous integrated dose, 66, 66 gray in 30 fractions. And whenever I discuss 66 gray in 30, it means it is a gross disease. It is equivalent to 70 gray. And second is the high risk subclinical disease. You can give 63 in 35 or you can give 60 in 30. So when I discuss the intermediate risk folia, this is 60 gray in 30. And low risk, that is the prophylactic dose. Uh, prof, uh, okay, and this is a low risk. This is a low risk. This is 54 gray in 30 fraction. So, or you can consider the 50 to 54 gray. That is mainly applicable for nodes. In primary, it is CTBP1 and CTBP2. There is no CTBP3 in for, uh, in, for primary in nasopharynx. There is a CTBN1, there is a CTBN2, and CTBN3 for carcinoma nasopharynx. So this is there are three nodal volumes and two primary volumes in customer nasopharynx. Yes, now we will discuss one by one. Uh, yes, so we know that we have moved from 2D to IMR. So this is a 2D when this is based on the landmark paper which published in Green Channel in 2012. So when we give, suppose if this is the your CTV and this is your CTV, maybe a CTV intermediate first CTV because this includes a lot of uh, the areas which are risk. And when we give two dimensional therapy, we are giving full dose to this area. That is why that is why we used to treat. When I was a resident, I used to treat a two dimensional therapy. Uh, so then the whole the the temporomandibular joint, then the parotid, then the brain stem, all used to do get get a high dose and the optic nerve, optic chiasma. But when we use IMRT, then the dose optimization, inverse planning, we can know that we can reduce the dose to the surrounding structures. You increase the dose to this, that is number one. Number two, the inverse planning has helped to form this, the posterior aspect. This is better, that is a concave shaped tumors. So this, the isodose can be generated by the IMR. So therefore, then we have moved from the, now it is the era of the olimetric treatment. The tartatolium delineation for the primary and the node. Most important thing when we before contouring the GTP, the resident, suppose to any resident who is going to contour any astronomy's parent, I always insist that that resident should examine the patient. Without examining the patient, never contour a patient. Because you are treating the patient and you are not treating the CT. You are a clinician. You have to know. What is what is the nodal status? What is the what is the, the cranial nerve pulses? Initial extent of the disease. We need to know. We need you need to know in and out before contouring. So you can gather by clinical examination by your MRI. If you have an MRI, good, well and good. If you have, then you have the the simulation CT scans, and sometimes you may have a PET PET scan to use. So you have all the features. Then uh, you identify structures. Then you fuse it, especially you fuse with MRI in the areas where you need, then you identify the structures. In notes, you have the, uh, that is uh, clinical examination. And yesterday we have discussed that uh, the GTV includes clinical examination, MRI, CT, and PET CT. In the notes, yesterday I told you that the retropharyngeal notes, the size criteria is 5 mm. And for the cervical notes, it is more than one mm, that's one centimeter or more, it's in the short axis. Or if suppose if we have continuous nodes of six to eight mm, or any node with a necrosis, then also you have to consider that it is clinically relevant. Now we are coming to the, uh, the contouring part. Now we are coming to the contouring part. So you have a tumor there. It is very difficult, as I told you that if between to differentiate between the T1 and T2, ideally you need an MRI. So this is CT. 
So this is the tumor, which is, this is your GTV. So then you have to give CTV, PG, CTV P1. So this is your GTV. Then you have to send how, how you will generate your CTV. It is CTV is 5 mm. GTV plus 5 mm, that is CTV P1. And when you have, you can edit from bone, you can edit from bone. And the, whether you should edit from air, that's an area of controversy for nasopharynx. Then you can have, if you have very criti close critical structures, suppose if you have, if you have the CTV is coming very close to the brainstem, I will show you in subsequent slides, then you, the UR CTV will be one up. So you, the, if you have an OAR, your CTV expansion from GTV is one up. And generally in this group of patients, nowadays we give induction chemotherapy because a lot of evidence is coming up because there is a reduction in distant metastasis, three clinical trials have shown, and one meta-analysis have shown there is an improvement in survival. For T3 or a problematic IMRP, then you can consider induction chemotherapy. So now the next step is to generate your uh, CTV. So GTV plus 5 mm, that is the CTV P1. If you have OARs, then you have to consider 1 mm. And the third question is that, do the whole nasopharynx need to be part of the CTV P1? Because whether the whole nasopharynx, that is the nasopharynx on the opposite side, also need to have the whole uh, 66 grain 30 or 70 degree equivalent dose. There was difference, there was a difference of opinion among the panel members. Many believe that there is no need for all of the nasopharynx. Okay, now this is 5 mm without editing. Then now you can edit in the bone. You can edit here. You can edit. You can edit in the bone. You can edit there. That is your CTVP1. Now you have this is another patient. This is a GTV. We have this CTVP1. Actually, you should not edit. Okay, this is you should, it, it may not be needed to edit. So this will be your actually it is like this. Uh, okay, can I take the option? So this is a, so this is your CTV P1. Now you have another tumor here. This is the uh, GTV. Now if, uh, this is another patient. This is your GTV, and you have the 5 mm. This is the CTV P1. You give 5 mm margin. Okay. Uh, if you have uh, a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, oropharyngeal carcinoma, in they say that from the you can edit from the pterygoid muscles. New guidelines say so, but that's that may not be applicable for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It may be better to give a 5 mm. So this is 5 mm, except the edit, you edit from the bone. You edit from the bone, that's your CTV. Now if you have a GTV. I'm sure this is not a good CT scan. So I wanted to show a bony window. So that is, so this is the GTV. And the CTV can be pushed anterior. So modification is possible. So this this will be, this will be, uh, this, this will be your CTV. Uh, can you see that? Can you see my mouse moving? Yes, sir. Okay, so that will be your CTV P1. Now coming to again this tumor. This is the this is the GTV, and this is your CTV. Let's say again you have a five mm margin. So that will be CTV P1. Now that is T1 and T2 disease together. Now if you have a T3 disease, T3 disease is bony involvement. It is T3 disease, base of skull involvement. Yesterday I told you clivus destruction. Cervical, uh, if you have a C1 vertebra or patient is having paranasal sinuses, all are T3 disease. Suppose you have a base of skull destruction tumor. And if you, this is the GTV. Okay, you have marked this is GTV. When you give CTV, what will happen? Again, another 5 mm. And this will, this will be abutting the, the PTV will be abutting what? The brainstem. The brainstem is at your risk. So what, what will you do? In this patient, so uh, suppose if you do, okay, you this is your CTV, okay. If you put a PTV, it will be in the brainstem. You got my point? And so what will do? You will do a, you will give induction. This happened when I was away for a lecture, my senior resident, okay. Then so, uh, okay. Then so this is the, your GTV. This is your CTV. And if you have a, uh, you give five mm margin. Actually, you cannot give. You give one mm, then you have a PTV. It uh, it is the institutional protocol that will be three to five mm. We use three mm. So then this this will be abutting your brainstem. So what will you do? 
you cannot give 66 grain 35. You give induction chemotherapy, the real situation, then you may have to use another oleum here, 60 colon dose here, and then you have to, and you discuss with the patient. Again, another clinical situation where you may not be able to keep. So I am giving you advanced disease to show you that it may not be possible to give concurrent chemo radiation straight away. This is the tumor. Again, you, you can see that in the sagittal view. This is the this is the GTV. This is the red one. The next one, this is the CTV, and this is the PTV. Again, you can see that this is the PT. So it is fast, not possible. Again, it is supporting the brain stem. You can see that posteriorly it is coming to the brain stem. So what will you do? Again, again, it is not possible to give. Either you give another volume here or you give induction here. Two options. Now we have paper which shows that induction chemotherapy and you reduce the volume, it will not have an impact on local control or overall survival based on a paper which published in Green Journal in 2018. I will show you that. So this you can give induction chemotherapy and uh, you can induction, you can, okay, so uh, uh, I have now of the wait. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, now, now uh, I told you that it is not possible. Can I? Can you, can see, you, my can you see my slides? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So I told you that firemum is not always possible. So if I use a firemum again, it will be very close to the brainstem. We have the CTV60 coming and you have a PTV60. You have a PTV66, CTV60 and PTV60 comes. So this will be somewhere here. The PTV60 will be somewhere here. So what I should do? I should reduce the, the margin, the GTV to CTV. P1 expansion should be one number. So this will be one number. Okay. And the second question is that whether whole nasopharynx is need to be keep. Whether whole nasopharynx need to be So the answer is that there is no There is no need for the same. There is no need for Okay, this we have discussed. Uh, now the now the, I'm concluding. I'm concluding. CTV P1 is GTV plus 5 mm. If you have an organ at risk, that is 1 mm and plus bar minus whole nasopharynx. Why plus bar minus whole nasopharynx? There are certain people in the endemic nasopharyngeal area use 70 gray to the whole nasopharynx. Okay, so that is given as uh, that is an optional thing. Now, Next question is you generate a PTV. So this is you have a GTV, you have a CTV there. This is a blue one is your GTV. Then you have a red one. This is a fire mum. Again, this was initial uh, uh, initial days of uh, that is maybe in 2009, 2010, 2009, 2010. So almost 10 years back. So we used a fire mum at that time PTV. So this is a fire mum, fire mum expansion. So this GTV, CTV, CTV to PTV, fire minus. Same similar to that, similar situation. Now coming to the CTV P2. So uh, I will take the questions at the end. So now coming to this, so in nasopharynx, we have CTV P1 and CTV P2. The CTV P2 means CTV P1 plus 5 mm plus the structures which are we are going to discuss. And if there is a critical structures are present, you give 2 mm. That is CTV P1 plus 2 mm. If there is any critical structures are present. And you include all the structures. The structures we need to be included in the CTV P2 are 1, whole nasopharynx. Number 1, anterior one third of the clivus. But the whole of the clivus, if cli clivus is destroyed. Yesterday I showed a patient with nasopharynx with clivus destruction. So in that situation, you need to include the entire clivus in CTV P2. Mind, there is no need to include the whole clivus, even if the clivus is destroyed in CTV P1. If you include the whole clivus in CTV P1, then it is very close to the critical structures. 
then the your ptv ctv p2 will be in the critical structures like brain stem then the volume will be more so even in clivus destruction is present then you give a 5 mm margin not possible you give 1 mm margin like i have shown you earlier then you include the whole of the clivus in the ctv p2 Retropharyngeal lymph nodes you need to include CHC that is from C1 to C3 regions, whole of the parapharyngeal space, the base of skull, whole skull base. I will show you that again. That is one of the areas where we discussed yesterday the pterygo palatine fossa because yesterday I showed that the connections of pterygo palatine was fossa. That is why I showed you all these uh, connections. And in uh, interior spinal sinus, in T1 and T2 disease, you need not treat the whole of the spinal sinus you can you can reduce that is the lower half is only need to be treated if it is t1 but if a patient is having spinal sinus suppose if it is a t3 disease then the whole spinal sinus should be part of ctbp not ctbp1 ctbp1 you always you give five mm margins and if any oir then you give one mm margin but in ctbp2 then if the spinal sinus is involved then you have to treat the whole of the spinal sinus i will show you that then posterior part of the nasal cavity and maxillary sinus earlier it was five it was one third then it became one fourth now the concerns based on the new guideline it is five mm when you have a t3 disease suppose if you have spinal sinus extension then you need to treat the cavernous sinus prophylactically because there can be a microscopic disease so cavernous sinus need to be part of ctv p2 in t3 and t4 disease. then retros styloid space the cross styloid space I shown you yesterday, that is the space which is posterior to the styloid process. The, the parapharyngeal space is divided into the two structures, that the anterior compartment and posterior compartment. Now, coming to a lot of questions are coming up in PNI is present that I, I will discuss later. Now, CTVP2, I, I have shown you this picture yesterday. Okay, this is the CTVP2, and you need to include the, this is the, you need to, this is the 5 mm. You take the 5 mm nasal cavity. The maxilla is also 5 mm. That is why I am putting this slide again. Now, the nasal, the, 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 nasal, the parapharyngeal space need to be treated. The whole parapharyngeal para, space. Then this is the retrostyloid area. This is the retrostyloid area. Then you treat the retrospharyngeal lymph nodes. Then you treat the entire thing in the parapharyngeal spot. Okay, this will be your CTVP2. Okay. I, I, I feel that this you are, you are with me. You need not take purposefully the lateral pterygoid muscles even in CTVP2. You have a CTVP1. Suppose if you have a tumor here, you give 5 mm margin. Then if some, sometimes the CTVP2 will come here, you need not take the lateral pterygoid muscle purposefully in CTVP2. You can spare that because then you can reduce the morbidity. You can reduce the morbidity. So you need not take the pterygoid muscles purposefully, but if you have it is coming with the 5 mm margin, definitely you have to treat. Otherwise, you need not take them purposefully. Now, coming to earlier, it was posterior one third of the nasal cavity. It was posterior one third. Now it has been reduced to 5 mm. You need to take only 5 mm margin. Then the anterior one third of the clivus. You need to take the anterior one third of the clivus. You need to take the entire nasopharynx. Then you have to take the retrostyloid area, parapharyngeal space, the both the parapharyngeal space retrostyloid area. This areas you need to be included in CTBP. Now, yesterday there was a discussion how to track the nerve for perineural invasion. That there are four radiological parameters to know where the perineural invasion is present. One, it is very difficult to track a nerve. You can see the nerve. It's very difficult. You can see only in an MRI. If the nerve is seen and nerve is thickened and nerve is showing an abnormal enhancement, perineural contrast enhancement definitely you can make out there is the first sign of a perineural invasion is widening of the neural foramen. okay yesterday we discussed the foramen wheel suppose if you see that there is a widening of the foramen compared to the opposite side you have to think that this is a perineural invasion is present this is a two nerves we need to we need to understand the perineural invasion of the maxillary nerve and the foramen uh, the mandibular nerve so we, yesterday I told you that the, the, the foramen which is associated with the maxillary nerve is foramen rotundum and foramen ovale for the mandibular nerve which is the third division of the mandibular, third division of the 
the sorry the the thirdish fifth nerve okay so then now thickening widening of the neural foramen loss of fat surrounding the nerve suppose if you have a loss of fat and the abnormal perineural contrast so this is uh, uh, you can see that if this is a widening compared to this side you can have the foramen ovale is wider and you can see the nerve which is also showing thickening you can see thickening and also enhancement means there is a perineural inhibition is present this is the foramen ovale and you have seen yesterday the foramen rotundum this is a foramen rotundum even on both sides and this communicates the tergopalatine fossa to the middle cranial fossa i have discussed yesterday uh, so this is the foramen rotunda here compared to this side this is an enhancement can you make out this is an enhancement there compared to this side this is uh, this enhancement then so this is a perineural invasion of the maxillary nerve okay sometimes if you have an pet ct you can see that, that this is a this is a tergopalatine fossa on the left side this is the tergopalatine fossa on the right side. What, what do you see? This is a widening of the tergopalatine fossa. And so you can see in CT scan. Okay. So what does it mean? It means in, there is an enhancement in PET CT and also widening of the tergopalatine fossa. Now we need to know the other foramina, like the foramen lacerum, we need to control. Then we have to, we need to know the jugular foramen, the hypoglossal canal that I will show you. So this is the, uh, this is how, this is uh, the, you can see that uh, this is the rotunda. You can see this is a rotunda. And the, the, this is a middle cranial fossa, foramen rotunda. It's very difficult to make out in an MRI. This is the jugular foramen. I will show you in the hypoglossal canal. <clears throat> so this is a, I will, I will repeat. I, uh, why I am showing different slides? because then you need to understand. Again, also, yesterday also I've shown few slides with foramen ovale. Today also I've, I'm showing for, for a few slides with foramen ovale. This is foramen ovale. Can you see? This is the foramen ovale. Okay, so this is the foramen ovale. Okay. Now, uh, you, have, you have a tumor, which is a, this is a parapharyngeal space, which is extending into the cavernous sinus. And this is also, you can see intracranial extension. How to make out a hypoglossal canal? So this is the hypoglossal canal. This is how you make out a hypoglossal canal. So this is the slice where you see it's hypoglossal canal. So this is the hypoglossal canal. Now, again, a small word about the tergopalatine fossa. Then you need to include the tergopalatine fossa in CTBP. So this is the tergopalatine fossa. Yesterday, I've shown the widening of the tergopalatine fossa extending into the infratemporal fossa through the tergomaxillary fissure. So this, you need to include the whole of the tergopalatine fossa, the inferior half of the spinal sinus in T1 and T2, plasmaminase. This is the foramen ovale. This is the foramen ovale on both sides. So you need to have a thin slices in the base of skull. Sometimes we may miss that. So this is the foramen lazerum. You need to include the foramen lazerum. This is the carotid canal. So you need to include that in the CTVP2. Yes, so this is CTVP2. Now, this is the cavernous sinus. This is, if a cavernous sinus in T3 and T4, then it should be part of CTVP2. Now, the biggest question is that, if you have a cavernous sinus, how much dose you will give in CTVP1? Okay, will you give 70 gray? Probably no. Then you give in Lakshmi Matara. Then you neg negotiate with the patient. Whether you need to have an increased temporal lobe necrosis or you want to have a lower, lower local control then you listen because there is no international guidelines okay now this is ctvp2 you try to include the cavernous sinus in patients who have the uh, t3 or t4 disease. Uh, so that is ctvp2 then you have a margin that is the your lower spinal sinus should be part of ctvp2 so this is the primary gtv this is the ctvp1 this is your ctvp CTVPT should include the lower half of the spinal sinus, provided the spinal sinus is not involved. Okay, so this is your CTVPT. This is slightly excess because this was uh, be controlled uh, before the new guideline. This included the posterior one third of the maxilla, posterior one third of the nasal cavity. And uh, earlier, the nasal soft palate also was part of the need to have to be included. But now, 
there is no need to take purposefully soft pallet. But if you give 5 mm margin and if soft pallet comes, that's fine. Otherwise, there is no purpose, there is no need to include the soft pallet purposefully in CT. Now, there are few clinical scenarios we need to understand. One is if the spinal sinus is involved. If the spinal sinus is involved, then you give 5 mm margin. That is severe CTP. But CTP PQ should, should be the whole of the skin. So this is your the yellow one is your C. So you need to include the one third of the fibers. Then uh, you need to consider the you need to consider the whole of the spinal sinus. And the to cover the nodes, you may have to come up to the caudal edge of the so you need to cover this. So this is the you need to you have to include the C the caudal edge of the C1 vertebra. So this is your CTV. Right? Now there are certain situations in CTV P2 you may not be able to keep higher mmr so the conclusion is that gtv to ctv p1 is 5 mmr if any oir is present it is 1 mmr then ctv p2 includes ctv p1 plus 5 mmr plus the structures which we have discussed the whole of the nasopharynx but when you have a critical structures present my audio is clear. My audio is clear. Am I audible, audible to you? I... Hello. Sir, you are audible. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a, if critical structures are present, then in the CTV P2, what is the margin we need to give? So this is your GTV. Then there are critical structures present. This is a clivus destruction is present. Then ideally you need to include the whole of the clivus, whole of the clivus. So you need to give a CTV P2. It should be the clivus. The whole of the clivus should be this included. But if you have a very critical structures are present, suppose if the clivus, the, the tumor is infiltrating here, then you may not be able to give a 5 mm margin. Then you have to include a 2 mm margin. So I'm coming to the final audience. This is your GTV. This is your CTV P1. This is your CTV P2. CTV P2 should include the parapharyngeal space, all other factors which we have discussed. I am concluding the CTV P2 by saying the structures again. One, all of the nasopharynx, and it one third of clivus, entire clivus if involved, retropharyngeal lymph node regions, parapharyngeal space, skull base, tergopalatine fossa, inferior spinal sinus, in T3 and T4, the whole of the spinal sinus, posterior uh, part of the nasal cavity and maxilla, 5 mm, Kavana sinus involvement in T3 and T4 disease and retrostyloids. And you give another margin of 3 to 5 mm to your CTV P2. That will be your PTV of the CTV. So you, you have a CTV P2, then you have you give 3 to 5 mm margin. So the final audience will be PTV. That will be PTV. Now, I conclude the CTV of the primary, GTV plus 5 mm margin, that will be your CTV P1. So, GTV plus 5 mm will be your CTV P1 or 1 mm if there are any OIRs. Then, CTV P1 plus 5 mm will be your, then CTV P1 plus 3 to 5 mm will be your PTV. Okay, of course. Then, CTV P2 includes CTV P1 plus 5 mm or 2 mm if critical structures are present plus the areas which we mentioned for. Thank God there is no CTV P3 for Now, if you have, if you are using induction chemotherapy, how to modulate your target volumes for primary tumor after chemotherapy? So ideally, if you can give, suppose if a patient had a T2 N3 disease, I will take a clinical scenario. That's the case for induction chemotherapy. So because there is evidence showing that N3 nodes are more prone for distemetrics. You give induction chemotherapy. You give two to three cycles. Two. For different reasons, one, have a better local regional control, with better uh, survival by reducing distal metastasis, number one. Number two, you do not want to adopt. You want to adopt with an induction chemotherapy rather than doing an adoptive IGR. So you adopt first, then you give IGR. Okay. For that, you give induction chemotherapy, either by cisgem or you give light TPF or you cisplatin by fluoroplast. That's fine. Then how to do after that? Okay, 
if suppose if a patient had i will give you an example t2 n3 so it is a parapharyngeal extension was there but there is no critical structures like there is no intracranial extension that is only t2 then you the post chemo we can give 66 3 in 30 fractions in your ctv means the post chemo if critical structures are not there then you give that entire area to ctv 66 but suppose if a patient had say cavernous sinus involvement very close to brain stem you cannot give 66 gray then you have to use an intermediate scholar that is 60 gray okay so there was a clinical trial comparing this, the treatment outcomes after reduction of the oleum. The, those patients were receiving induction chemotherapy for carcinoma nasopharynx and further treated with IMR. It showed that there is no difference in overall survival or progression to survival. This was three year results. We need more long term follow up. Okay, coming to the coming to the notes. Coming to the notes now. Uh, Yesterday, I discussed retropharyngeal nodes, the characteristic retropharyngeal nodes. This that ranges from C1 to C3 vertebra. And bilateral nodes will not change the staging. Now, the new guidelines, suppose if you threw the contouring guidelines and the 2013 update of the nodal stations by the Vincent Gregoire and group, we can see that only lateral groups are seen. Medial groups have been removed in the classification. This higher amount or more, it is significant. Any necrotic node, the respective size is significant. A cervical lymph nodes, more than 10 mm, significant. Or contiguous or confluent lymph nodes with each other, that is short diameter of 8 to 10 mm, you take it as possible. Or if you have an FDG node, if you have a PET CT and PET CT shows any uptake or any lymph node with necrosis, then you have to consider that this patient is having a cervical lymph node due to carcinoma. I will take very simplify the slide. I have simplified the CTV N1, CTV N2, and CTV N3. Okay, CTV N3 is optional. CTV N1 and CTV N2 is mandatory. Okay, CTV N1 is equivalent to what is GTV? The involved node. Involved node is the GTV plus 5 mm margin is the CTV N1. You have to give 70 degree equivalent dose. Your GTV node plus 5 mm, that is CTV N1. And if extra capsular spread is present yesterday, so there was a question regarding extra capsular spread. I didn't answer purposefully yesterday because I want to I wanted to answer this question today. If extra capsular extension is present, then you need to keep one centimeter. But this will not upstage the disease because N3A and N3B is not there. Even if the extra capsular spread is not is there, it is only size criteria. Suppose a four five into four centimeter node. And is having extra capsular spread. That is, if that is N1, otherwise it is N1, otherwise. If it is N2, bilateral nodes, uh, then it is N2. And it will not change to N3 disease, like this pharmacy carcinoma of head and neck. So it is one centimeter extra capsular spread is there. You give one centimeter. I will show you slides for that. Second is, if the patient is having, say, you believe that this patient is having a T1N0, what will be the nodal oleum for a T1N0? So yesterday I told you that all retrofemdal bilateral nodes, bilateral level 2, bilateral level 3, and bilateral 5A should receive 60 gray. Okay, it is very important to know this. Suppose if you have a tonsillar disease, T2 N0, okay, you may give the level 2 60 gray, but you will never give level 3 60 gray. No need for that. You can even argue for a level 2 to have 54 gray. No need to give 60 gray. But you can argue, but generally you may give 54 to 60 gray for a level 2 node on ipsilateral side or tonsillar disease or related. That's not the case in carcinoma nasopharynx. So you give, you have to give between 50 to 60 gray. There is two school of thought. Actually, actually, there is two school of thought. And but generally, many people believe that uh, if you have a N0 neck, you give the retropharyngeal nodes bilateral level 2, level 3, and 5A. You give 60 gray. That's what we practice here in my institution. If you have a level 3 node in mod, then level 4 also will receive 60 gray. At least one level below the involved node ranges. That is what the guidelines also share based on the, the consensus guidelines which published in 2018. Okay, if beyond that, suppose if N0 is there, do you need to treat the level 4A or 5B? It is optional. 
but generally we give 50 to 54 today why because there are papers which have shown that if even if the patient develops a nodal relapse in the course of the follow-up and these patients are more prone for distant metastasis even if you cure them up following a neck disease. so it is better to have a good local control and then to have better survival so you try to so whether a a lower four or five b can be avoided if it is n0 my answer will be i will be more comfortable in treating the whole neck rather than avoiding 5 and 5 4 and 5 so the whole neck will receive 54 day if n0 from my side you can say that it is 4a and 5b will be treated will not be treated what you see is also absolutely right i have no a clear evidence to say that 4 and 5b should be treated in a patient with an n0 neck but if you say that i will not treat level 3 level 4 sorry level 3 level 5a then i will be against you so for an n0 neck see you have to treat bilateral retropharyngeal nodes in level 2 level 3 and 5a to minimum of 60 kilograms okay suppose if you have a level 2 node okay you take level 2 node then you treat level 3 you have to take one level one at least one level below the involved node regions the so level 2 node you treat level 3 also to 60 kg. but level 4 and 4a and 5b you should treat if a node is positive you should treat the entire neck at least to 50 kg. okay now i will take one by one so first step is to delineate the nodal nodes so you need to know the nodes so you can see that the nodes on this side and left side you can see node on the right side so first my task is you can see this nodes on this side you can see nodes on this side and you have to go the nodes okay that's your gt so this is your nodes okay then then next is to generate a what a ct okay gtv to ctv is fiber so this is your fiber can we edit this okay you can edit okay so this is fiber so that is the gtv you have nodes here okay this is the gt this is the gtv then bilateral level two nodes bilateral level two is what yesterday i told you bilateral Nodes are above the caudal edge of the tricot cartilage is N2. Minimum stage is T. Okay. So first you do this is your GT, the involved nodes. Okay. Then you give a margin that is 5 1. So this is your CTV N1. This is your CTV N1. Okay. Then this is the that region you need to in, incorporate. Whether you need to give level 3 region, you need to give the level 3 also to give 60. So this is your. This is your 60 gray only. This is your 66 gray. 66 gray in 30. And uh, this is the 60 gray in 30 only. Okay. Now, so you need to treat if you have, uh, you need to treat the this much regions. If you have bilateral regions, you need to treat. Suppose if you have, uh, you have the nodes in level three, you have to treat the level four. This is the level three because thyroid cartilage. If you have level three nodes, then you have to treat the level 4 also to 60. So you have bilateral nodes. You have bilateral nodes. You have bilateral nodes here. This is your GTV. Then, uh, then you have you have to have the. This is your GTV. Now you have the CTV. This is the CTV 66. Now you have the you have this this is your gtv this is your ctv 66 and this is your ctv 60. you have the ctv 60 so you give 5 mm margin then that that region so the uh, this is the the anti level 3 the anterior it comes to the posterior one third of the thyrohyoid muscle so this is the anterior limit of the level 3 lymph node posteriorly for this we are treating level 5a also that's why it has been taken together the posterior limit of the level two, the, sorry, level three is the posterior limit of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the level five region, posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. This is the level five. So you have the, you need to treat the level four also to 60 degree. So you need to treat, suppose if you have bilateral level three nodes, you need to treat the bilateral level four to 
60. Now, the question is if you have an extra capsular spread, if you have extra capsular spread, then the classic teaching is that you need to keep one centimeter above three dimensional, you need to keep one centimeter. So, this is the GTV. So, you have an extra capsular spread, this is infiltrating the strain of meter mass star. Then you give a one centimeter mark. So can you make out? This is a one centimeter mark if extra capsular spread is present. That is your CTV N1. So this is your CTV N1. Then you have the CTV N2. You give another margin to 5 mm. So this is your this is your GTV. This is your CTV N1. This is your CTV N2. Right? Now again, I am concluding that if you have an N0, you have the CTV, then you have the CTV, you, you do not have a CTV N1. So you have your CTV N2 will be bilateral level 2 retropharyngeal nodes, bilateral level 2, level 3, and 5A. If you have a node, then you have a CTV N1 plus 5 mm, then at least one level below the nodal region. I think it is very clear to you. So this is at the level of the level 2 because this is the caudal edge of the hyoid bone. That's a level 2. You have a node there, then you have the CTV N1, this is your CTV N2. Then this is your ETV N2. Okay. So this is your now, uh, this is again, so, sorry, this is the GTV, this is CTV N1. Okay, okay, then you have to include that. Now, if, uh, uh, this I have clear. So, I have, I have, uh, so if you have an N1 plus CTV N1 is GTV node plus 5 mm, 1 centimeter if extra capsular spread is there. CTV N2 is equal to CTV N1 plus 5 mm, and CTV N2 also includes retropharyngeal nodes, level 2, level 3, and 5A nodes bilateral. This is very important. And if you have nodes are there, at least well, one level below the involved node regions. Rest of the regions, that like suppose the patient is having a level 2 node is involved. Level 4 and 5B, you can see it is the CTV N3. And you can have a low risk colon. That is, a, it is a 50 to 54 we need to be given. Now, coming to the 1B node, suppose if you have a 1B node, if you, whether it, whether submandibular gland need to be included in the contouring. If 1B node is included, 1B node is involved, then you have to include 1B. That is, then it becomes a 66 gray wall, 1B. Second, if a patient is having a submandibular gland level 2 with extra capsular spread or the structures which train into 1B, like if you have extension to maxilla or drains into 1B or the gross nasal cavity extension, then you have to use an intermediate risk volume for a 1B node. Otherwise, you need not treat a level 1B prophylactic. So, if you, if you have an extra capsular spread, you need to give one centimeter mark. Now, the contouring guidelines for critical structures, which is published in uh, Green Journal in 2014, you can go through that. Okay, I'm not going to discuss it first. Now, for, you need to know that the potential improvement, suppose, there are, there are some papers which is coming up that if you give induction chemotherapy, the volume can be reduced. Okay, you can see that this is again, this is a, a paper which published in, uh, this is a published in, uh, this is a paper from the, uh, paper from the uh, and WE, which is to give chemotherapy. You can see that the post chemotherapy, there is a huge reduction in volumes after chemotherapy. So you can, you can reduce the modeling. Okay, uh, yes. This paper I have already discussed. Coming to the planning acceptance criteria. So, in, so you have contoured the primary tumor, the nodes, as well as OIRs. I didn't discuss the OIRs, but when you will when you will approve the plan, there is a new guidelines and acceptance criteria has been published very recently in Red Journal. I will discuss that. Before that, this is a classic guideline is that GTV you need to have 100% dose to the at least 100%. CTV, 98% dose to the 100% of CTV. PTV, more than 95% dose to the PTV. More than 95% dose to the 100% of PTV. So that is, that is how you approve. Then you need to know that the critical structures, the tolerance, brainstem, 54 gray, spinal cord, 45 gray, optic chiasma, 54 gray, optic nerve, 54 gray, temporal lobes, uh, you can consider point dose to up to 65 gray, but you try to reduce the dose to 60. And the, the organs have been 
described. Okay, this is a new paper which came uh, in Red Journal in 2019 last year, which shows that I uh, it is almost 8:30. I'm sorry. Okay, so if this is uh, they have given a prioritization and acceptance criteria, OER prioritization and acceptance criteria. So the the priority number one is one brainstem, number two spinal cord, and third is optic chiasma. These are the priority number one structures. So always you try the dose. Suppose if the dose is 0.3 centimeter cube, you can see that. So it is a point dose can be up to 60 gray, otherwise 54 gray. So this is uh, the acceptable criteria. Desirable dose is 54 gray. Spinal cord it is 45. The acceptable criteria is up to 50 gray. And optic chiasma desired dose is 54 gray. Now the second, the second priority is for one GTV, second PTV, and temporal lobe. And the third priority is for optic nerve. That is the third priority. And if you look into the parotid, in the priority is number four. So you need not worry about parotid. Okay, you always try to have a good local control. You try to preserve the parotid. Yes, I agree to a mean dose less than 26 gray or at least 50% dose to 50% volume to say 30 gray. So that's fine. But your priority number one should be to reduce the dose to brainstem, spinal cord, and optic chiasm. Second is you try to achieve good dose to the GTV and PTV. So you have to have a PTV. This is a minimum. I, uh, this is due to lack of time. I'm not going into the details because it's already 8.30. So this is uh, the coverage you need to be uh, this is uh, the coverage you you have the ctv and ptv coverage of the, you have this and this is the ctv p2 coverage and the ptv p2 ctv p2 and ptv p2 coverage this is the uh, this is 66 gray in 30 fractions um, and uh, as it says this is the 60 gray in 30 so at least you try to achieve 95% uh, of the 60 green 30 to PT, all of the PTV, 60 that is 57 green. Now coming to the, uh, the evaluation after treatment. So this was a T2 disease uh, with the infiltration of the median pterygoid. And uh, I'm not sure the pterygoid plate is destroyed there, then it becomes T3. So this patient was given uh, IMRT. And after that, so when you have to evaluate the patient, Never take a CT or MRT. Okay, then the, your radiologist will say the possibility of residual disease cannot be fully ruled out. Slight thickening is there with a minimal contrast enhancement. Okay, so the thickening will be there. So this was the site where the tumor was present. Okay, after the CT scan, after the CT scan, post CT, after so in my institution, after carcinoma nasopharynx. The clinical examination will be done to the neck after the completion of radiotherapy. No adjuvant chemotherapy. So if the patient node is in remission after chemo radiation, the first follow-up is after three months. We will not call the patient up. If the patient is having residual node at the time of completion of chemo radiation, the patient will be called up to so assess the node. Then you take a CT MRI scan, preferably. The primary site should know whether the remission in the primary site. And if there is a residual node, then you start the remission for a neck dissection after three months. Never consider the neck dissection before 12 days. If there is a residual node, you be most of the time if you do a neck dissection, it will be a necrotic issue. And the patient will be young patients. So there will not be any viable. Again, this is another patient which we have discussed. This patient had induction chemotherapy then the chemo radiation i had given another very small o area to 60 degree then the, this will be the look after the chemo radiation this temptation is coming for follow-up and this is there is a slight thickening mild enhancement but this is not the same i sincerely thank each one of you for the patient listening um i have given the uh, email id and my mobile number if you have any queries uh, please uh, send me an email or mobile whatsapp me and i am free to share this slides uh, if you are interested just email me uh, then i will send you my uh, slides and if you have any queries either you contact me through the gmail or through my whatsapp 
Thank you very much for your patient uh, listening. I'm happy to take few questions. Uh, yes, sir, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of questions. Yeah. Yes, sir, the first one, uh, uh, should CTV be cropped from the body by a margin of 3 to 5 mm to save skin if it is not involved? Yeah, yeah, of course. For any site, we can do that because I, I didn't mention that because that's a standard practice. That's applicable for nasal pharynx also. Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, so how to address planning issues when PTV extends outside the body? Should we crop the PTV or should we just uh, create a PTV eval for uh, evaluation? Yeah, that, that's a situation where a situation of, okay, we generally do not entertain such situations. You PTV if extends for beyond the body, you limit to body. Okay, you will not. Suppose there are certain situations where this, where you are, I will give you a clinical scenario. Suppose if you have a large node which infiltrating the skin, okay, then your your PTV itself will be outside the uh, the body. So you have a very skin, very close to the skin. Okay, then you have to use a bolus. But there is no point in me if our physicists are more comfortable in limiting. There is they, they generally do not plan when the PTV is in the air. Okay. All right, sir. Uh, so criteria for induction chemotherapy followed by CTRT. How would you choose a patient for induction okay. chemotherapy? Okay, so uh, if you buy a large, we can say that all patients with T3, T4, N2, and N3, there is evidence to give induction chemotherapy. The two indications for induction chemotherapy in head and neck is one, the advanced nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and other is a advanced hypopharyngeal tumor based on the URTC trial. So here we have six randomized trials. So if you have a T2, N2, I will give you a clinical scenario. So that patients have small nodes on level to bilateral nodes and a tumor with a parafandial extension, I may not give induction chemotherapy. But if a patient is having a clivus destruction is present, I will always give induction chemotherapy. If you have an N3 node, I always give induction because there is evidence now and that also, this is a problematic IMR. Then you can reduce the OLM post chemo, then you can either you can give high dose if possible, or you give 60 gray if there is a reduction in the volume of the uh, volume of the disease. Uh, so can you please clarify volumes of uh, GTV and CTV in this patients with post induction chemotherapy? Okay. okay. And, uh, yes. 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 And doses to this pre and post chemo yeah, volumes. Of course. Right. If you have, if uh, if you have if the guidelines, the 2018 guidelines say that after induction chemotherapy, if there is no critical structures are present, then you have to give the full dose. You should not reduce the dose. Suppose if the patient had a parapharyngeal extension was present and after chemotherapy it became a T1, like there is no parapharyngeal extension, but the initial volume should be given a 66 gray. The dose should be if possible, means there is no critical structures. But suppose if the patient had a cavernous and its involvement, intracranial extension, and if we give induction chemotherapy, there will be some residual disease in the intracranial part. So whether we should give 66 gray in 30 or whether we should give 60 gray in 30 in that situation, that needs discussion with the patient and family. Okay, this is not clearly defined internationally. It is we have to individualize such situations. And you have to discuss with the patient. Then you negotiate and you approve. Rather than suppose if it's a very subtle nodes, then even if it is involving the temporal lobe, you can even go up to 65 gray. But you cannot go beyond a certain OLE. So that we will discuss with the patient. All right, sir. Uh, so you have shown how to identify PNI. How do we contour PNI? Yeah, contour, you track the nerve. If that may not be possible always, because that the characteristic perineural invasion is seen in the adenoid cystic astroma. So if there are certain situations, you may be able to identify the perineural invasion. Like the perineural invasion is characterized by either the widening of the foramen or thickening of the node, or there is an enhancement of the node, no, sorry, enhancement of the nerve, or thickening of the nerve. Then you can say there is that nerve is involved. Most of the time, you may not be able to make out the nerve per se, but you have to, you can make out the tumor. Suppose your cover and sinus involvement is there. Most of the time, the, the, it may be through the mandibular nerve, or it may be the middle cranial fossa, maybe due to the maxillary, through the maxillary nerve. But we may not be able to see the nerve properly. 
Yeah, if it is possible, that's fine. Now, every situation you have to see in MRI, if possible, in CT, you may not be able to do that. In CT, you cannot make out a perineural stimulation properly. Uh, so the lower limit of volumes of uh, 4B or 5B nodes? If you have a if you have a 4A and 5B, if N0, dose is say 50, 50 to 54. Which, which, which way you use? We are using 54 grain 30 fractions, 1.8 grain per fraction. But if you have, say, if you have a level 4 node is there, then you have to, then, sorry, level, then you have to, if, if a patient is having level 3 node is involved, then we have to treat level 4 also 60 grain. 60 grain 30 fractions. Uh, so any difference in 66 grain 30 fractions versus 70 grain 33 fractions? Uh, no randomized data. There is okay. no data. There is no data. No evidence. Okay. Uh, so any compromise in OR doses and CTV doses in adjoining structures? Any, any, okay, of course. Yeah, it is in many situations you have to you have to negotiate. Suppose if a patient is having a tumor involving both orbits, both orbit, very advanced disease, both orbit. The best we, we will not be able to condo that patient because we because both optic nerve will be involved. So you cannot give a high dose. So you give induction chemotherapy. Again, we have to negotiate with the patient. Again, so and if a patient is having parotid involvement because of the T4 disease and a large node on other side, both parotids will be will be at risk. So you cannot save the person. So every time before leaving the patient, uh, what I always say to my resident is that you after CT simulation, you ask the patient to wait. Okay, you discuss the radiology with the radiologist, and you go through the CT scan, radiologist, and discuss with the radiologist and negotiate with the patient and then only send the patient home after CT simulation. Most of the time what we do is that um, when you start condoring, if, if you see this is involved, then, then whether to give induction chemotherapy. So then we have to be very clear that we are not giving induction chemotherapy, number one. Number two, we need to be very clear with the patient and family regarding the audience. Need situations. If anything, any, any negotiation is required, we may give you induction chemotherapy. Okay. Yes. Uh, so should we give tighter constraints to OIRs like the constrictors and oral cavity in, uh, to reduce mucositis when NACT is given? Uh, most of the time, what we have seen is that if you give NACT, then the uh, the dose to the oral cavity will be less. Okay. So there may, we may not be needed. It may not be needed. Uh, constrictors, okay. Uh, it may not be possible to save the superior constrictors in carcinoma nasopharynx. It will come in 60. Okay, the lower constrictors you can you can try you can try to save. Yes. So any data suggestive of treating whole of nasopharynx to 70 gray in case of unilateral disease? Sir? Okay, no, we, we generally do not. Generally do not. Uh, we give if it is a unilateral one side T1, we give 5 mm margin. That's fine. And the whole nasopharynx will receive 60 gray intermediate scoring. So the, ex, uh, the expansion of one centimeter superior inferiorly in case of e, &E uh, is this specific to nasopharynx or uh, applies to all head and neck squamous cell carcinoma? Applies carcinomas? to all because whenever there is, if you go through the paper which published by Vincent Gregoire in Green Journal in 2006, which have clearly mentions two clinical situations, one post-op dose and also patients who have extra capsular spread. They clearly mention that if you have a one, one centimeter all around, if you have a node, there is no need to give the whole Suppose you have a level two node, which is showing extra capsule spread. Whether the whole level two should be given 66 gray? No. You give node plus one centimeter margin, that is 66 or 70 gray, whatever it is. You follow 70 to 70. But the rest of this level two need to give only intermediate scoring. It is, no, it's not. But in Europe, there is a tendency that even if in such situations also, they are reducing from 60 to 50. The Americans still follow 60. In our clinical situation, it may be wise to stick on to 60 and not to 50 or 54. Yes. Uh, all right, so that's all. So that was a wonderful session. I'd like to request uh, Dr. Pooja Sethi to extend the vote of thanks and conclude the session. Yeah. On uh, behalf of organizing team of RCC, Jupiter, sir, we thank you for excellent presentations and uh, joining with us on both the days.